today. We're really excited. We're very excited to uh, to join together to be uh, discussing the metaverse and what are some of the impacts that we might feel in the real estate industry. My name is Andy Hunt. I'm the v director for the Center for Real Estate at Marquette University. Uh, we have taken an interest in this space, uh, both because it's going to be impacting our real estate world and also because we happen to be at the head of uh, our current consumers, which are Gen Z, who are very comfortable with this space. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that as well today. So we have a pretty uh, all-star uh, panel to join and uh, and talk to you about today's topic. Uh, we're going to go through a couple of introductions, and then we're going to dive through uh, some questions, uh, including things like, what is this, the metaverse? What do we need to really know about that, and how do we define it? We'll talk a little bit more about why it matters. Uh, obviously, uh, really important to think about use cases uh, and, and how we might be experiencing it in the future. Um, we'll go through a little bit of a demo, uh, which everyone should be really excited about. Uh, that We've seen some previews of this in our pre-calls, and it, it really will blow you away. Um, we'll talk a little bit about Gen Z. As I mentioned, we have uh, two of our students here at Marquette uh, who competed in a uh, global competition through Cornet at the Global uh, Summit a few weeks ago in Chicago. Um, and then we'll, we'll uh, finish up by talking about a few deeper impacts and uh, things to kind of leave you thinking about how this is going to be impacting your world in the future. So without further ado, we'll start off with a few uh, self-introductions. Henry Massey, uh, Henry, welcome today, um, and we'll let you get started. Thank you, Andy. So as everyone heard, my name is Henry Massey, Senior Vice President of Workplace Strategy and Technology at Impact Group. I've been in the industry for 20 years now, worn many hats, have worked in every vertical but I'm generally fascinated in technology and how they solve for our problems. So professionally, I do focus on strategically aligning software that fits organization requirements and business processes to solve for their needs and create stories through data. Uh, the above can also be said for emerging technologies like the metaverse and Web3, but more importantly, how did I get into this world of the metaverse Web3? Uh, it, it all really started back in 2002 when the movie Matrix came out, but also after that, uh, a book called uh, The Matrix and Philosophy, Welcome to the Desert of the Real, also came out talking about really the, the philosophical end of the Matrix, because that was a digital world, in, in essence, uh, to where you can be part of. Uh, me being semi of a, of a creative visionary, I always questioned that sense of reality uh, and that possibility, and that was all of 20 years ago, and, and here we are now, facing that new realism. So that was something that I always started uh, to be fascinated in, started doing a little bit of research in that, that whole area. Then come 2017, got involved with blockchain and cryptocurrency. And again, that was a whole other area that I became incredibly fascinated with, which is the digital aspect of cryptocurrency. Uh, again, fell in love with that and really started studying that realm. Uh, so fast forward today, I have been continuing that research in Web3, in Metaverse, in cryptocurrency, and uh, look forward to continuing that journey. Thank you, Henry. We're also joined this morning uh, by Nishar Fatima. Nishar, welcome today. Thank you, Andy. And that's a tough one to follow, uh, but I'll try my best. Hello, everybody. I'm Nishar Fatima. I lead the global workplace strategy efforts for a company called ServiceNow. It's a workflow automation software company. Uh, and my main goal under this role is to maximize our employee engagement by leveraging the power of technology and AI uh, to improve our performances of our services and the real estate portfolio. One of the other focus of my role is to also lead our new world of work, which is in many other ways a future of work, but we try to stay away from that, uh, that world. But it is mainly to bring the cultural alignment between our 78 global locations uh, and I've been lucky to have that opportunity to work and live in many countries like India, Singapore, Germany, and now I'm in New York. So it really helped me bring that global perspective to the table. Uh, I also lead our workplace strategy initiative, which are mainly focused on, we call it evidence-based approach. And that is to mainly gather and manage data intelligence and explore tools which are helping to increase the employee experience. And currently one of the tools which we are exploring is, of course, being in the metaverse. And personally, it started with me when I was playing Fortnite video game with my husband over weekends few years ago. And I'm like, how cool would this be if we translate this into a workplace and make use of it? And cut to here, we are today talking about it. So I couldn't be more happier. Uh, I'm super excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Ishar. Your, your ability uh, to really measure the sentiment of the kind of the end user experience, I think, is going to be so fascinating for our audience today. 
So let's uh, bring it back home uh, to the Midwest. And we have uh, two students from Marquette joining us today, Jet Smith and Eddie Makar. Uh, Jet, why don't you get started? Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jet, and I'm here with the better half of my team, Eddie. I'm Eddie Makar. Pleasure to and, be here. And so we recently competed in the Cornet Global Academic Challenge, where our prompt was to navigate uh, the future impacts on corporate real estate at the intersection of the metaverse and other emerging technologies, and then further how those um, technologies have enabled and will continue to enhance um, workplace design and overall strategy. Well, wonderful. And thank you, gentlemen. Uh, so Henry, Nishar, Jet, Eddie, pleasure to, to have you join us today. Henry, let's dive right into this. We have a lot to cover and a lot of exciting things ahead. Uh, why don't we start off with uh, taking us through the simple, the simplest of questions. What is this? What's the definition? Let's go. Fascinating question, Andy, and thank you. Um, so first, I wanna to present a little bit of a challenge to everyone who is, is here with us. In the chat room, please go ahead and write what you consider to be the definition of metaverse perhaps what you've learned through headlines. Uh, and let's let's see how this definition that I present lines up to that. My goal here is to really baseline, again, what the definition of the metaverse is and provide examples behind it um, and really just tear it apart is really my, my goal of this so that we can all walk away and be educated finally on what truly is the metaverse. So I'll give you guys maybe just 15 seconds to go ahead and start uh, dreaming up the, the definition and, and writing that in the chat room. And then I'll get started on the definition of it. Let's see some chats coming in. Good, good, good. Andy, do you wanna read maybe one of them just to get this thing started? Absolutely, Henry. So we, ha we have a couple that are, that are coming in and they're really interesting. Um, one, one person said, a very expensive undertaking. Is it worth the investment? Uh, <laughs> Real-time 3D rendering was another. Uh, and a, a, a VR, AR environment that provides an immersive audio-visual experience to work with virtual assets in a collaborative sphere. Um, right. I like the AR, VR mentioned there. Um, basically, the matrix, someone else said. That's a great one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Roblox is another one. I know, uh, you know, some of you will will talk about that a little bit today. A digitized extension of our physical environment. These are some good ones, Henry. Fun, fun, fun. Awesome. All right. Thank you, everyone, for providing that definition. I'm going to provide a definition that uh, based off of research and what I have found to be uh, more true than not is this definition by Matthew Ball, who's a fantastic author and has done incredible research over a few decades. The definition is a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds that can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users with an individual sense of presence and with continuity of data, such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. This is a semi-deep definition of the metaverse. You, you'll notice that I've got several words underlined and the purpose here is that we're going to tear this thing apart and really talk about what are we what are we talking about specifically when it comes to these specific words uh but just fun fact down below i broke down the word metaverse meta as a whole just by itself means beyond and verse is just a back formation of the word universe so a combination the meta and the verse is intended to be the unifying layer that sits above and across all individual computer generated universes which i consider virtual worlds so that's what I consider to be the definition, but more importantly, let's let's break this thing down. And at the very end of it, as soon as I've explained really all of these underlined words, we're gonna reread the definition and hopefully that, that'll really shed some light on what it is that we're even talking about. So the first word that was underlined is 3D. So as we know, a lot of virtual worlds can come in many dim dimensions, but 3D is essentially that critical specification that we're looking for when it comes down to the metaverse. And now if it wasn't 3D, then what are we talking about? Are we just really just looking at the, the existing environment that we already know, which is web two, uh, that has just got a 2D dimension. But there have been a lot of philosophical discussions talking about, can we really transition the human culture and label from the physical world if it's not 3D? 
In my personal opinion, I don't think we can. So 3D is definitely a critical element when it comes to the metaverse. Next is real-time rendering. So rendering is the process of generating a 2D or 3D object or environment using a computer program. Uh, to specifically give an example about this is, let's think about the, the movie industry. Uh, when movies come out, let's, let's use Monster Inc. as a perfect example. Uh, it's a Pixar movie that has to be rendered. If, if we were to try to render that specific movie on one of our personal computers, that would take two years to complete. That is a lot of time. And obviously we're not gonna wait two years for a movie to be rendered and nor can the movie industry wait that long to put out a movie. So for the metaverse to be the metaverse, we need real-time rendering. So the virtual worlds to be truly alive, real-time rendering is required, which means ideally 120 frames must be rendered per second. Supercomputers are needed. And right now only large organizations can really afford to have these types of supercomputers available. So again, technology does need to catch up. Uh, this isn't saying that, hey, the metaverse is here because we're definitely not saying that the metaverse is here. We have to catch up from a technology aspect to even get there. Uh, and I'll pause there because I'm, I'm kind of bringing up a very key element. The metaverse is not here yet. Uh, the metaverse, it, I know a lot of people were slapping the coin word metaverse on everything. Someone mentioned Roblox. Roblox is an element of the metaverse. It's really a virtual world. So when you hear like Decentraland, Roblox, Sandbox, Verbella, these are virtual worlds. These aren't the metaverse. The metaverse isn't here yet. It's estimated to be truly here probably in the next few years, hopefully sooner than that. Uh, but the earliest we're thinking is about maybe even three. And I'm gonna talk about, you know, why the metaverse isn't here yet, what is required for the metaverse to be present. And those are that's why we're tearing this definition down, hopefully we can circle back in and, and talk about that. Next word, which is probably the most important word in this entire definition, which is interoperable network. So this term refers to the ability for computer systems or software to exchange and make use of information sent from one another. If you remember in the definition, it's talking about your, your identity, talking about payments, talking about uh, your avatar, being able to cross virtual worlds. That's what we're talking about here. Right now, as we know it, there's multiple virtual worlds. Neither of these virtual worlds are connected. So let's look at like Decentraland, Verbella, Roblox. Each of these different platforms require you to create a new profile, a brand new avatar that looks and feels completely different than the other. So when it comes to interoperability, I need to have one identity, I need to have one avatar that can be able to cross every single realm. I need to also be able to cross, um, you know, decentralized and I need to easily be able to hop into the next environment, not having to log in, log out, go into another uh, virtual world, so on and so forth. And also the importance of payments. There needs to be some type of standardization of payments between all of these different platforms, right? We have uh, centralized platforms, decentralized platforms, some are using USD, some are using cryptocurrency. So there needs to be standardization in terms of payments to be able to call uh, the metaverse the metaverse and be interoperable. Next, we have massively scale. Now, when you think about the internet today, there's an infinite amount of websites, right? So when, when a new organization, for example, comes online, uh, let, let's say I create a brand new LLC. The first thing that I'm gonna do is create a website that is Technically, how I'm going to mark myself as uh, I'm live. I'm an active organization. Everyone come come see me, essentially. What's cool, or actually, I'll pause there. The metaverse, in order to be the metaverse, we need to have the same thing. We need to have an infinite amount of virtual worlds that are interoperable. Everything is talking to each other. The fun fact here is that they say that within five years, every organization will also have a presence inside of a virtual world that will be acting as their website. Imagine that one, right? The amount of websites that we have today, the same thing will be about uh, companies that exist within the metaverse or a virtual world that have a presence. They'll have a digital HQ, if you will. Now imagine being able to experience a company in that fashion, instead of going to a 2D website to learn about, what is your mission statement? Who are you? What are you about? What is your service line? What's your about us? Who's your team? What if you can go and actually discover that yourself walking into a digital HQ, 
and being able to talk to someone real or front desk, someone who can make you or give you a nice introduction to the company, that would be a very engagement or engaging conversation that would last with me for quite some time. The experience versus, you know, website versus the virtual world would be incredible. Persistence has got to be one of my favorite ones just because it has a lot to do with technology and it's a crazy idea, but persistence has to do with um, permanent change, not only for me, but for everyone. I have an example here that's talking about Super Mario Brothers because uh, I think we've all can relate to Super Mario game to where you're in a, a very ugly looking world where you jump on a, on a turtle, the turtle goes into a hole, disappears. But when you have to restart that level, that turtle is alive and well, still there, right? This is the idea of persistence that you know, whenever a change is made inside the metaverse, this is a permanent change, not just for you, but for everyone that is part of this experience. But something more tangible, I think that we can all relate to is, let's say we're in a game, a game that exists today, right? Not like old school 80s, 90s games. You see Henry throwing a baseball through a window. You hear, you can see the window break and everything, right? But if you walk away from that scene and you walk back and you look at that window, that window is intact as if nothing ever happened. So this is the idea of persistence is that in the metaverse, when the metaverse is here, in order for it to be the metaverse, this change not only is experienced by me, but everyone and anyone who's around me to also witness that. They can see Henry lifting up that ball, throwing it through the window. They can hear the crash. They can see the after effects. Now what's going on here is there's incredible computational formulations that's going on the back end saying, is this change permanent? Is this permanent for Henry? Is this permanent change for everyone who experienced it? And is this a permanent change for everyone who's gonna come into the world who wasn't even there as well? So that's what's going on with persistence, that whatever I do in the metaverse, that change is forever. And everyone who experienced that event of me throwing a baseball through a window also experienced it at the same time. And again, the change for them is, is also persistent and permanent. So that's the idea around persistence. Next, we have synchronous. And I think this is my, my personal favorite, but this has to do with Zoom meetings, right? Like right now, you and I think that this is a live live session, right? Is this a synchronous connection? And the answer is, is no. And this was mind blowing when I discovered this, is that what's really happening in technology wise is that Zoom, uh, this instance, because we're all on Zoom, is, is actually recording snippets. It's recording my hand motions, it's recording my voice, it's packaging it and then sending it to you fast enough and unpackaging that to make you feel that this is a live event. When in reality, this is not. This is truly not a live conversation. To give you an example, maybe you guys can recall this maybe in, in a meeting that you've had. Have you ever experienced where all of a sudden the, the speaker, whoever you're speaking to, maybe is starting to speak a lot faster and then slows down to the normal speed? This is because that person or someone along the line experienced a disconnection. You went offline for a second. And Zoom continued recording the snippets, packaging it, and sending it to you. It sends those snippets again to you faster than usual to make you feel like you're still engaged in that conversation. Didn't break the uh, the, the the back and forth discussion, right? Again, this isn't this isn't a live discussion. So that's that's a technology that we are experiencing today. Uh, so in order for the metaverse to really truly be the metaverse, it needs to be synchronous. It needs to be live. No no packets going back and forth. Then we have unlimited users and individual presence. So some of the most successful video game companies in history with the most powerful computers still have a hard time sustaining 150 users. Uh, there are virtual worlds that I, I have experienced that can only sustain 120. And the minute they hit 120, they reduce your look of your avatar to a silhouette, for example, right? It starts to change the experience within the actual technology. And as you know it, if, if, if the experience starts to diminish, our engagement in that particular product is going to decrease. So naturally, we need platforms to be up to speed to be able to host an unlimited amount of users. So to wrap it up, I went pretty deep in, in talking about all of these different words. I'm going to reread the, the definition of the metaverse, and hopefully my explanation of everything that we just talked about makes a little more sense. 
So the definition again, it's a massively scaled and interoperable network of real-time rendered 3D virtual worlds that can be experienced synchronously and persistently by an effectively unlimited number of users with an individual sense of presence and with continuity of data such as identity, history, entitlements, objects, communications, and payments. So that is the, the definition. I'll, I'll take a quick breather on that one, let everyone digest it. Is there any questions so far on, on that before I jump into the my closing statement? No, uh, Henry, un unbelievable. One of the things that that stands out to me to me the most um, is just the idea of breaking down the difference between the metaverse, which is holistic, and virtual mm -hmm. worlds, which make up that universe. Um, so I, I love I love that angle that you've that you've come at this with. I think you've really made it make sense. Let, let's dig a little bit more into, into some of these other technologies because it all it all kind of comes together, right? It does, and I think that's the importance of this particular slide here is that. I know we've all heard different keywords out there, right? Like blockchain, Web3, NFTs, metaverse. But it's important to be able to um, just loop it all together and, and give you that, that final story to, to understand how they all tick and tie. Um, so let's start with that. So blockchain technology is the underlying technology that is used on the back end to run the metaverse that you want to enter, right? That, that's blockchain. Web3 is the front end tech used by your consumers to interact with applications and services your brand wants to provide. Um, in, a, in a previous webinar, I, I talked about, and I actually went in depth of, of the evolution of the web, web, web one, web two, web three. If anyone on this call wants uh, to better understand that evolution, by all means, reach out. Uh, we are currently building web three. We are currently in, in web two, so everyone understands that. Like, you know, so, social media, you know, our capabilities of paying online, Amazon, that's all web too. NFTs are the access tokens, the membership programs, the keys to gated spaces and experiences that your brand will create for its fans and customers. NFTs is not strictly just art. It's not funky looking apes. So I, I hope everyone understands that because that's kind of what the headlines really uh, tries to paint. It's, they're focusing too much on, on art pieces. The metaverse is the actual space where people will come and spend time to interact with events, concerts, gatherings that our brands want to run. Now, to take everything that I just talked about and to really just loop it in to, to, to close that circle. So metaverse would be like Disneyland. NFTs will be the tickets and the fast passes you need to buy to get in. And when you're in it, the rides and the roller coaster experiences would be Web3. But the operations of electrical and power grids or technology that power the Disneyland experience is what blockchain, blockchain technology is. So hopefully that paints a better picture of this ecosystem that, that's being built. Henry, this is just phenomenal. Thank you so much for breaking all this down. We do have one uh, quick question that maybe you can, you, can, uh, you can chime in on, and that's how do you foresee standards and protocols getting implemented in the metaverse discussion given the largely decentralized landscape? The, uh, and of course, the context of that is um, there's going to be a lot of collaboration needed um, for this infinite amount of interoperable worlds to exist, right? So how, how does everybody kind of come together on, on agreeing on uh, how, what the metaverse uh, becomes? I think, um, yes, so, so the first answer is is through DAOs, is decentralized organizations that are focusing on, on building these universes. Um, so I'm not saying that every decentralized virtual world is going to have a DAO, but that that is the start. And a DAO, if you know anything about DAOs, there is no organizational hierarchy here. It's a flat line organizational hierarchy. So anyone who's part of this, it's again, they're, everyone's equal. They all have a, a vote in what's going on. Um, so that's going to be the most important aspect, I believe, of creating these universes is that DAOs need to be organized. Everyone needs to be able to communicate freely on where they believe these things to be going, what they want out of these spaces. Um, at some at some point, I believe that all of these DAOs will need to be collaborating with each other, and I do believe that will happen because Web three today is more on a empathetical code development, and that's what we're trying to get the internet to be is more empathetical, right? We need empathy in the in the web today, and that does not exist. Can I speak to the big conglomerates right now about that? I can't because they're on centralized platforms and they're kind of creating the virtual worlds in their light um, on how they want these things to, to go forward. Uh, I do believe it'll it'll take some time for everyone to, to be 
unified and to have a centralized uh, point. But I'll throw a little wrench in there. I, I don't think that the, the metaverse is going to be one strict thing being centralized or decentralized. I think there's going to be a combination of the both. But yet us as users will get to vote. How do we want to interact with the metaverse and interacting with a centralized platform or decentralized? Awesome. Thank you so much, Henry. And, and, and a great question from our audience already. Our audience is coming in hot. So uh, this is great. Nishar, we're going to move uh, forward and we're going to talk now a little bit more about why um, why this matters. And, and, and the idea behind this is that the user experience is critical. Um, so we need to start to think about that. And I think when we start to think about why should we care, we need to think about that in terms of users. And you are the perfect person to uh, to speak this. So Nishar, welcome. Thank you, Andy. And thank you, Henry. That was some great insights into Metaverse. Uh, and I love how you dissected the entire definition. Well, it made my job a little bit easier, but in many ways tougher as well, because now I have to make it how we are digesting in the, uh, the corporate real estate world. Uh, my perspective is going to be more from an occupier or end user's lens here. And I'm going to step back a little bit to help you understand the overall scenario on why the conversation of Metaverse began at our organization, right? And how it all started. Uh, for audience who, who are listening here, I heard Joshua actually mentioned in the chat that is it expensive undertaking? Is it worth an investment? And that is the dilemma we started our conversation with uh, in our organization as well, right? So I would say ask, uh, ask the question, which is why we are doing this instead of what we are doing it, right? And that really will help you narrow it down uh, from the employee experience and engagement perspective. For us, it was a little bit easier at our organization to, to reach to that why, because uh, interesting thing about ServiceNow is we have tripled our number of employees in last two and two, two or two and a half years. Uh, and as a result of pandemic, like every other companies, we have had the personas, which are your remote persona, your flexible persona, and your required in office persona, right? So about one third uh, of our company is a remote persona. And what that means is they don't come to the office uh, on a regular basis. They only come to the office for moments that matters, right? And having said that, there was a dire need for better connectivity, giving the best experience to our employee, whether you're working from office or you're working from home. And obviously we want to make sure that there's an increased uh, number of collaboration between them uh, because, critic because it's, it's definitely critical and that's what all organizations are talking about, right? So between our remote workers and our flexible workers, now we are at the crossroad where the question is, how do we bridge that gap? How do we make sure that no matter where you're working from, you're feeling connected and you're feeling part of that same community? Uh, and my suggestion for those who are you know, trying to get onto that route is uh, your conversation probably should start with uh, you know, your shift. Uh, it should be shifting from return on investment to return on human capital in many ways. And it should be tying back on employee experience and engagement part, because that in many ways is uh, subjective, I would say. And it's it's not measurable, but it's also at the same time, you want to make sure that you are constantly doing the surveys and asking your teams uh, right questions in terms of uh, what what is the need, right? And what, what kind of activities they are doing where we could give them these proper systems and tools to enable that. Uh, the feedback we receive at our organizations through our pulse surveys or our focus groups or our even listening tours is the main common factor was lack of informal collaboration and what we call it our water cooler chats, right? Or building interpersonal connections or building a sense of community. And that's what we really wanted to focus on. So we said, well, Zoom is obviously not helping as much because we've been using it for almost three years and it, uh, there's still that feedback that we, we are lacking these things. So uh, I'd love to run through some of the use cases um, as we go along and kind of talk through it on what, what were, we just listed down what were the challenges for us in terms of use cases. So started the conversation with, uh, as I mentioned, water cooler chats were definitely something which the informal chats where you're bumping into your colleague and then have that most innovative conversation sometimes right? like that naturally informal collaborations, your team collaborations uh, were definitely something which, which we wanted to increase. And Zoom definitely helped us to stay connected, but it's very much on the need basis, right? If I have to connect with you, I have to send an invite and then we organize that half an hour, 20 minutes to talk. It's not organic. 
And that's what we were missing. And we that's when we started exploring that, what are the different tools? What are the different ways we could do it? And, and the extended reality, virtual reality metaverse came into the conversation. And we also wanted, we realized that we could do a lot more than just team collaboration, right? There's one use case, which, which is here, uh, which talks about exhibition setup. Uh, and we, as a service now, as an organization, we are very big on Black History Month, women, women celebration and all of that, Pride Month. So we thought that we can actually hold a virtual exhibition where we could portray our heroes and uh, even our service now heroes on that and put, a, put an exhibition and people can just walk through and learn about what's happening inside and outside. Large company gatherings were another one. Uh, all hands, for example, we, we have all hands situations where it's hybrid. Some people are in the room, some are in the uh, a, a, taking calls from home from different parts of the geography, but can we make it all unified and be more inclusive? Right, and that's where we we could explore uh, large company gatherings and all hand through these scenarios. A more connected experience, right? If you have, if you need a help from your IT folks, then you could have an IT sort of like lab, which is your virtual support. You could just walk in and talk to them and kind of ask what what are the questions instead of raising tickets. And you know how it goes, right? You raise a ticket, it takes a while to come back, which is still inefficient. But we were trying to explore more ways. And I would definitely like to highlight that we are not trying to replace in-person by any means. Uh, at least that's what I believe. We are trying to find a better alternative to build that sense of community. And that's where uh, I come in from. New hire orientation is another great one, right? How do you make these millennials or Gen Zs when they're joining our force feel equally energetic? And we could utilize the metaverse or virtual reality to bring them uh, and make them feel as part of community. So yeah, I, I think I could go talk a lot about it in the use cases aspect, but I think best would be, Henry, I think we should show it in the demo form so that everybody understands how we are translating all these use cases into actual virtual reality. I think that is a fascinating pivot. Yep. So for everyone's knowledge, we're gonna be transitioning to actually going into a virtual world called Verbella. Confirming, can you see the virtual world, Nishar? Yes. Awesome. All right, everyone, so welcome. This is Verbella, and you can see Nishar is actually approaching me on my right-hand side. So this is our avatar. This is how, how we identify with ourselves. Again, this is a virtual world. This is not the metaverse. However, we are at the beginning phases of trying to explore the technology. And like Nishar mentioned, how do we collaborate with each other in a very unified way that just creates more engagement, right? So this is a way that we can do that. So you can see Nishar waving at me so she can express herself. This isn't limited to just a head and shoulders. You can actually see a full body, which I think a lot of people in the industry are like, well, how, how do I assimilate with a, a half body emoji or a avatar? So definitely progress in this arena. So just really quickly, we're going to show you how it is that we can engage in this particular arena, if you will, uh, to give you a quick landscape view of where we are and what this campus is all about. Top right hand side, I can click on the map and show you exactly where it is that we are within this particular campus. So as you can see here, we are shown in this uh, red area as here, but what importantly, what, what's here? Where can I go? What can I do? In this area. So you can see you have an auditorium, you have a pavilion, art center, community hall, uh, you have a, a big business area on the top left, uh, speakeasy, which we'll check out later on, as well with other type of CRE spaces. And maybe like a Verbella Tower. I think a lot of you think like a Salesforce Tower. This is something that they've done in their particular campus. You, again, you're not limited to just going into your brick and mortar location, you know, doors, walls, windows. You have the ability to go anywhere including on a boat inside the water. So if you wanna have more fun in this arena, you can. So I'll go, go ahead and go back to say hi to Nishar. And Nishar, do you wanna to navigate real quick on where we're gonna go next? Absolutely. I think we should show them our, uh, our space, how it becomes private, even though you are standing in the public ground. And uh, as you can see, the, there are these pods, which are your seating elements with, out in open. And we could just quickly grab a seat and just take a position. But the interesting part about this place is you can see the blue halo line uh, on the ground. That halo line actually helps you create the privacy. 
So if now me and Henry, if we are talking, we won't be able to, uh, we don't have to basically uh, kind of worry that if people are listening to me or not, right? And I actually got signed out for some reason. So I'm gonna go sign in right back, but continue talking that that really helps you create the privacy pod uh, while you are out in the open ground. So I, I really appreciate this, uh, this kind of setup because you, you are in the ground, let's assume if it's your office campus, you're still on the campus, but if you want to have a private conversations, you can just step into these halo lines uh, and continue your conversations in many ways. So, uh, Henry yeah, and Ishar, it might be great to point out at this point that you aren't using virtual reality as your experience in this right now. You're you're accessing Perfect. this just through your computer, right? Can you just talk about that a little for a second? Yeah, fascinating point, and that's, that's something that I think we need to quickly debunk. Is a lot of people think that vert uh, that the metaverse is virtual reality, and it's that's not it. Virtual reality is a tool to access the metaverse or a virtual world. Right, it's like it's like saying that your phone is the internet. No, your phone is used to access the internet along with a lot of other different types of things that you can access. So that's thank you, Andy. That is a fascinating one to to quickly debunk. So yes, I'm I'm using my desktop, and and quite frankly, uh, a lot of virtual worlds that are out there right now don't even have VR headsets enabled yet. It is a add-on feature that they are going to do later, because to a lot of people's points. We're not there yet in terms of that technology and with, with VR. No one really wants to be jugging around the, the massive units on their faces. And, and quite frankly, uh, motion sickness is still a real thing in that tech. And they are trying to resolve that. So uh, I believe a lot of virtual worlds are still concentrating on developing their environments via desktop first, and then it'll gradually progress. I do want to add uh, that first, when we started this exploration, we did start with the Oculus. Right, and we realized that in the demo group we had, we had somebody who had fractured hand. Uh, one of my colleague is partially colorblind and somebody's wearing specs which are heavy high numbered. So like Henry mentioned that they were feeling dizzy because they had very high power. And uh, one of my colleague who had had hand fractured, they couldn't operate the hand tools which comes along with the VR. So the inclusivity became, became a conversation for us uh, with, with our people team, with our HR team, that we want to make sure that any tool we use are extremely inclusive. So that's where we found this common ground where we are still in the virtual world, but we don't have to put on our headset. Not saying that that shouldn't be an option, but uh, this is coming from perspective of one organization, how we started our exploration and what we learned along the way. Are you sharp? What do you think we uh, go to an actual office space and, and dis discover those possibilities? Sounds good. So we're going to teleport to our team suite, we call it, where uh, it'll be more like an office environment. And we want to show you how it looks like when we are in the office uh, environment. Fantastic. All right. So I think what, what I want to highlight here is these are uh, this is like a replication of your typical office environment. And as you can see, we if we are going in this one of the rooms, uh, right? Let's try to go in the Ryan's office, for example. Right now, what we are seeing on the screen is uh, for screen stays black out uh, until you enter the room. So again, privacy is being hugely taken care of. The moment you get into the room, you will start seeing the screen being lit up. So the passerbys are not seeing the presentations or private discussions or confidential discussions, you might be having it. Um, and that's really, I think, is a critical piece as well uh, in many ways. Uh, the other thing which, uh, Henry, if you want to highlight it, that how if screen, if things are not readable, you can actually zoom in into your own private screen. So just put the press button and it really zooms in for you. So you don't have to struggle in terms of what you are seeing uh, on the screen if it's in virtual environment. I thought these were some of the great features uh, for using the office rooms in, in an environment where it's still a little bit uh, making it feel like you can read and make meaning out of it. The other favorite one of mine is the door control. Uh, Henry, if you want to point it towards door control. So what? how do I restrict people walking in just like how we walked in into this room, right? If me and Henry are having a confidential conversation, I can actually lock this room by just pressing the lock. And that really allows nobody to enter until we want them to enter into the room. I thought that was a great feature or addition to, uh, to the environment. Another feature I wanted to highlight, and thank you, Nishar, for pointing that out, is, is how are you sharing your information 
inside in, in environments like that. And that is a big security uh, issue that IT likes to focus on is how are we sharing this data? Is it secure? Where is it going? Now, Verbella in, in this case offers two choices. One, you can load your information to their servers. And of course they can host it on uh, their behalf. But obviously a lot of organizations are not comfortable with that. They say the next option is, well, you can do a screen share. Now, the beauty of this is that I, I don't have to send them anything. I can literally, like I'm doing right now, I can share my screen and, and host it on this particular view. Even, uh, I can't do it in this particular case, but you can even show your, your in real life persona, you know, me, myself on this video uh, screen as well, in case that people wanted to see a more real representation of, of who you are. So these are capabilities that you can do currently in this tech. Yeah. And just on the interest of time, should we should we go to auditorium and show our audience quickly what auditorium setup looks like? Let's do that. All right. So as you guys know, on the top left hand side, I have a way to quickly navigate certain areas and go to it instead of having to walk there and be limited by speed and gravity. Oh, looks like I joined the wrong one. Demo. Yes, I'm in the demo. Demo right. Nishar. <laughs> I think Hi, that, Nishar. that's the beauty. You can actually save time and commute as well here from going from one room to other, which we kind of forgot how to do that. Yeah, Nishar, I think one of my favorite thing about this auditorium is there's no bad seat in this auditorium, even though it's a large auditorium space, uh, because we can actually sit anywhere and kind of zoom in into um, any screens we want to. So if I grab a seat right there, for example, um, and Henry could grab a seat somewhere else, but you can see how he can zoom in into any of the screens uh, from the top. So you can really have a closer look to see what it looks like for you. Um, and it could really give you a podium look or a stage look, speaker look. And the best part about this, when I saw the demo for the first time, which made a lot of sense for me is both the screens on the either side could actually flash your presentation. And in the center where it says Dell, you could actually have your Zoom window with the, with the real view. So when your CEO is talking, for example, if this is an all hand setup, you can actually see him talking on the central window and have those pre presentations floating on the either side. And be still feel that you are part of the room and not in the Zoom square, uh, like how traditionally we are. Nothing against Zoom, they have given us a lot of collaboration, uh, but it, also we are, as I said, right, we need to find an alternative ways to do things in the environment. All right, I think it's time for us to head outside. Um, and just in the interest of time, I do want to give Eddie and Jeff some time to speak. So we're gonna probably head out to, to our outside campus and just want to show how it's not only the interior spaces where you can work, you can actually work in the exterior spaces as well and make most of the environments. Um, I'm just about to follow you. Considering it's a live environment, it's still pretty fast, isn't it? It's not too, too much slowing down and it's transferring us uh, from one space to another in, in a quite a big manner, in a fast manner, I would say. So I really appreciate that aspect that you don't have to wait for too long. And there I am with you, Henry. Hi. So that is a good point, Nishar, is that this particular campus here is open to the entire world. So this isn't, you know, one specific organization's platform. Anyone, including yourselves, can go ahead and access this. If you go to the Verbella website, uh, you can go ahead and create your user if you'd like, your avatar, and you can even join us here if you'd like. Yeah, and same situation. If this this is the outdoor setup, right? You could actually speak with your colleague and have presentation or brainstorming in the outdoor environment. You don't need to do that uh, just in the office environment as well. Uh, and I thought this was great. I would be always sitting here and my colleagues would be finding me here <laughs> all the time working out from the outdoors to just act to or contribute to your mental health and well-being, which is a big conversation at our organization. So yeah, just wanted to showcase this. And I think uh, because again, we are running tight on time, I uh, maybe 
Henry, we can just go to our speakeasy and end our conversation there so that we get to hear Eddie and Jet. Let's do it. All right, I'll see I'm not sure if everyone can hear it, but there are birds chirping. It feels like you're in the nature. It's it's like a campsite. It's quite beautiful. Yes, we can hear the birds chirping. It's great. It. So something that Nishar mentioned is is you know like a, like a game room, an arcade, uh, a place for you to decompress, if you will. As we know, music is a lot of people's lifeline. Right. What better way to experience a fun time enjoying maybe your favorite band, your music, whatever it is, with your colleagues, your friends, family, whatever, and hang out. This is their virtual way of doing that is decompressing, dancing, listening to music. This has got a bar look and feel to where you can go to uh, a side table. You can go ahead and jam. Uh, right now you can't hear the music, but it is a fun EDM type music. You can see Nishar breaking down her moves, having a fantastic time dancing. And there was a summit a couple of weeks ago, it was the, the Economist Metaverse Summit 2022. And there were 50 people in here dancing. It was, it was quite the experience. You know, there was uh, 300 people who were in the actual world itself. And uh, people from all over the world were able to sit here, collaborate, dance with each other, and just decompress, be goofy, if you will. I'm trying my twist move. Let's see if that. <laughs> what Henry, should I break into? You'll have to show us at least one move yourself, Henry. All right, all right. I'll pull, I'll pull up the dance, the the salsa. <laughs> That's fantastic. So, so I think <laughs> what we were trying to overall say is that there are a lot of use cases you can explore in this environment, and it's really up to up to the organizations and up to the end users or the uh, you know how you are actually maximizing this environment. So that's really what the message we were trying to get. Uh, but thank you so much, uh, Andy, for for letting yeah. us explore this. Henry and Nisha, this is this is incredible. I think you've really inspired a lot of people uh, of the what is possible uh, type of thinking, and and that is r really something that I know that we are going to take away from today, which is really great. And not to mention the fact that there's hope for all bad dancers out there like me, um, <laughs> you know, of a brighter future. Uh, in the metaverse of, of some of those skills. By the way, Nishar, a couple comments about uh, about really liking uh, your shoes uh, and your outfits. So um, wanted to pass that along. And there's some interesting aspects of that, Henry, that I know we're going to touch on at the end as well um, uh, as it relates to being able to kind of keep our IP, if you will, uh, and, uh -huh. and what that could mean for, for larger things. But we're going to shift a little bit now where we, we started what, you know, what is this and why does this matter? We've seen how that works. Let's talk, let's go to the, the generation that is really going to be the metaverse native generation. Um, and that's, uh, what Jet and, and Eddie are representing. Gentlemen, I, I know you're, you're comfortable representing an entire generation. So thank you for that. Um, you guys had a really interesting experience. Cornet is clearly a leader in uh, thought leader in this space of thinking about the metaverse and impacts um, on real estate. And that was the prompt of the global competition that you guys made uh, the finals of just two weeks ago in Chicago. Um, tell us a little bit more about what you learned. Just three questions for you today. First question, tell us a little bit more about what you learned uh, during your experience at Cornet. So I would say the you know primary thing we learned is that general knowledge of the metaverse is limited like um, the majority are not understanding the metaverse like Henry just explained it um, and I think it's important to start you know spreading that understanding so um, people understand it better and then in terms of strategy um, and the strategic approach to the metaverse um, in terms of real estate you want to be more agile and what that looks like is making probably shorter term real estate decisions um, as well as overall, we're probably going to see a reduction in physical space by around 20 to 30 percent. So starting to make those shorter term real estate decisions um, and reducing your space will be um, keep you agile as things are changing so quickly. We also learned that uh, companies are going to need to focus on enrichment and enhancement with more amenities. And these amenities are going to be able to allow the employees to really be themselves and bring out that authentic culture that companies are looking for and that people are trying to remember when they're going back to work. And another thing is that hybrid and remote work, are there, they are here to stay. People are not going to let go of the freedoms. And along with, they proved that they can handle this responsibility and they don't want to miss their children's lives while they're growing up. So they want to be at home and live with their family as well. 
and that flexibility is so real. I, this is one of my favorite parts, by the way. We, we see case competitions at the student level across the country. Nobody does it like uh, Cornet does in terms of uh, literally part of the competition is we want you to be at this global conference and talking to others, especially Cornet members. So all the information, everything you guys learned came from other Cornet members, which I think is so cool and just kind of speaks to the to the strength in this space that Cornet has. Uh, okay, second question for you guys. Um, do you, do you really think Gen Z would be pretty comfortable with the metaverse in, in a in a in a professional setting in a business setting? You guys grew up around the gaming side. Henry mentioned some of those aspects uh, of this, but um, do you see yourselves in the metaverse in a professional setting in the future? I think it's really interesting because there's a few perspectives that our generation probably takes on it. The first is being very nervous. Um, because we missed out, quote unquote, on that year during COVID and kind of older generations made sure to tell us that we missed those crucial experiences being remote and virtual and miss out on whatever year that was in your development. So I think there's a lot of nervousness when people think about living in the technology or what a lot of people think the metaverse is going to look like. And then I think on the other side of that, there's people in our generation who understand the metaverse and its capabilities and view it more as a tool um, for not only work, but most daily activities that we engage in. And that's similar to how the internet it evolved to be integrated into every aspect of our daily life. And then furthering that, we realized that the goal of this metaverse technology is to ultimately increase freedom, equity, and accessibility um, in the workplace and those other areas of life. I also think right now it is difficult to see in a professional setting because most of the people in our generation has only experienced it through gaming and really haven't thought of it being implemented in their work because everyone, we all have such an idea of what work is going to be. So to think that it's going to involve the metaverse is kind of a wild thought. However, that Verbella demonstration from Henry and Nishar really opened my eyes to how it's going to be a virtual tool and be integrated in the virtual workspace and make it more authentic experience with your fellow employees. I love that you guys keep using the word authentic experiences. I've, I know that that's really something that Gen Z seeks out. And and it's it. thank you for the reminder for all of us of what that means. So, okay, so let's get to the last question. This is something you guys are uniquely, perfectly suited to answer. Um, what does the ideal workplace look like for your generation, in your opinion? So... I like to think about it as uh, like the flexibility of college, like that college type schedule. We have times to be in class and we are we are obligated to be there just like we have to go to a meeting for work. And then if we miss for like an event or we have something else come up like an interview, we're able to watch those classes virtual, which is critical because if you miss a class, you're falling way behind. So being able to watch it virtually is extremely important. And then another big part of being in college, you get to choose where you get to do your homework. I don't have to sit in this one cubicle all day and do the same thing over and over, but instead I can go to the library. I can go to the park if it's a really nice day. I know there's not many of those in the Midwest. So when, the, when they do come, it's very important for us to actually get outside and experience them. So the ideal workplace, it allows for the flexibility of the college experience. And as long as work gets done, I don't see a reason why people shouldn't be able to live their lives along with their work. And another thing is uh, we need to be in person half the time. I do believe that like metaverse isn't fully there to get that person to person connection. So while it's still being developed, I'm gonna think it's very important that we still go in person and make those authentic connections. And uh, it'll also make a smoother transition from college to the workplace, being able to still like explore your city a little bit and not just be in your one spot eight hours of the day. And yeah, off of what Eddie said, we, we definitely realize the importance of in-person work and see that as more of a, you know, more than half the time in person, but still incorporating that flexibility and freedom similar to what we have in college. And we think that as this metaverse technology evolves, it will attempt to bridge that gap, like Nishar, Nishar said earlier, um, between the authentic in-person experiences and that hybrid or remote work experiences. And then with the hybrid and remote work, we found at Cornet that remote workers can feel very isolated. And something that's especially important to our generation is that recognition um, in feeling successful or recognition of a good job when you're at work. And we see that social media has been a really good way to inspire that recognition or show that. So dedicating efforts towards that recognition um, for especially our generation will really enhance that 
um, engagement and make sure that nobody's feeling isolated. And that also allows people to share their successes with the rest of their network and even friends and family that might not normally see your successes in the workplace. Gentlemen, I can't thank you enough for the perspectives. Congratulations again on making it to the global finals. We're incredibly proud of you and, and so grateful to Cornet uh, for that experience. Henry and Nishar, you both have been incredible. We are nearing the end of our time, but why don't you bring it home with just a few final deeper thoughts for everyone to take away? Sure, and this is gonna be uh, <clears throat> a little bit down the rabbit hole. And it's gonna be a little more of an advanced topic because I think we need to start thinking about uh, a little more outside of just the metaverse as we, as we know it, right? I, I know virtual world is a very new concept to a lot of people. And I think showing Verbella was uh, an example of that. It's just to introduce you to that. But we have to think about what's after that. What is part of the metaverse and what's happening within corporate real estate or even the workplace? And that's what I'm going to highlight right now. Um, again, if any of this is super confusing, by all means, reach out and we can totally have a, a nerdy discussion on the future of Web3 and the metaverse. <clears throat> now, I want to highlight three use or four use cases that, that Nishar pointed out. One is orientation, training sessions, immersive learning, and employee arcade. All four of these examples have two things in common. One is self-identity, which is I'm going to talk about self-sovereign identity. And two is your, your experience within the workplace. And this is going to start shifting into the conversation more on Web3, blockchain, uh, tokenizations. So that's that's the little rabbit hole that I'm going to go into really quick. And by all means, I do expect this to be a little more like, oh, wh what is this? And how do I learn a little more about that? So let's dive right in. So self-sovereign identity, and I'll, I'm going to pause there. A big element of Web3 is you owning your information. That is the point of, of Web3. So as, as we know it, Web2 is read, write, edit, consume. You do not own any information that you put online, right? So like if you're looking at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is, all the videos, the pictures, your sentiment, how you feel, LinkedIn even, right? All of that is, is you're providing free content in exchange of getting technology for free, right? You, you have a, a platform you can use for free, but they're farming your information. They're farming everything that you're providing into their platforms. I don't think a lot of us remember that. Uh, I saw a, a post on link or Facebook the other day. You know, someone was talking about data and, and farming your data and and being a little more um, a company tracking your carbon footprint. And, and there's a big outrage. I, I had to jump in. It's like, guys, you know, you're using technology right now that's already doing that. They're just making it more blank and putting it in front of you saying, this is what we're going to do going to the future. Now, Web3 is allowing you to, again, read, write, edit, consume, now own. That is the missing element that we're trying to focus on. You are now allowed to own your identity. You're allowed to own the information that you actually put online. Mind-blowing, right? You actually can monetize on your personal information. How much personal information do you share currently on the internet? Probably a ton right? Do you ever see that you all of a sudden get ads that pertain to something maybe you were just talking about three seconds ago with your colleagues? That's not by mistake. It's not some crazy power, right? It's, it's technology as we know it. This information, now you're going to own this information. You have a choice of how people or you get to monetize on the information that you put out there. So as part of your self-sovereign identity, what, what do I mean by this? Uh, in the future, currently right now, you have an ability to create your digital identity. Uh, you have the ability, again, to create a digital wallet through means of, let's say, MetaMask, for example. This is a digital wallet that will pertain to me. I'll have a unique IP, a unique address that is mine. And anything that I specifically contribute to the internet, it'll be part of my digital wallet. As part of your digital wallet, you're going to contain things like uh, your identity. You might have your W4, your I9, your social security, your passport, your license, your credentials, your um, skill matrix when it comes to work. Think about how we look at the resume today, right? It, it, everyone has their own way of selling themselves, uh, talking about what they know, their skills, who they've worked for. All of these elements can be part of your digital identity and will sit inside of your digital wallet through something we would call tokens. 
And now this is where I'm talking about, we're kind of getting advanced in the area, but this is where we're going. This is where Web3 is currently trying to create as we speak, is this self-sovereign identity to streamline, to automate, to make efficiencies, uh, not only in the workplace, but globally. Now, I want to focus now on the journey of an employee when it comes to an organization. This is really talking about uh, the potential, the future of where we're going, when it talk in, in essence of, of self-sovereign identity, uh, how corporations, organizations can use Web3 as a technology to create engagement inside of the office. Because I think that's the biggest component that we're struggling to get right now, post-pandemic, if that's what we're in. But we're shifting in a new way, in a new fashion. There are organizations who are decentralized. Um, if you talk to an individual called Chris Moeller, um, Orion Growth, he's recommending everyone that, that does talk to him, create decentralization, be remote first, and then figure out where you're going. But the point here is we need to create engagement inside the workplace. Web3 is allowing us to do that. Same with self-sovereign identity. And I'm going to talk about exactly what that means. And this is what this journey is all about that I'm going to quickly try to run through because I know I'm short on time. Where does the journey start? It starts with an interview. And as I mentioned, the resume is a very old school concept of getting a job, right? It's just, you know, you have a Word doc, you're writing a bunch of stuff, you're sharing things through email. There's no sense of automation in this at all. And there's no efficiencies on that post, uh, let's say you're getting a job. So what's going to happen in the future? What is already happening today is, like I mentioned, inside of your digital wallet, you're going to have these tokens. You're, it's going to be essentially your resume. It's going to have all your skills, who you've worked for, what you've done to, to build your persona. So what's going to happen is HR, your hiring manager, for example, is going to ask for permission to access your digital wallet, and you will be able to grant them permission to certain areas of that wallet and say, okay, I want, I only, I want to give you my employee information, who I am, citizenship, all of that good jazz, my skills, who I work for, and that will be uh, on them to go ahead and analyze. Now, this is where the efficiencies in the, the onboarding process comes in the automation is now instead of HR having to go into their HR system and, and manually put in someone's name and manually put in all their whatever it is, they can automate this now because it's all sitting on the blockchain. It's all available to them. So now they can automate the, the filling of these forms to speed up this process. Now, let's say successfully Henry got onboarded. Yay. Uh, I can be given... A, a certain amount of social tokens that are preloaded to my wallet. This assumes that this organization is tokenized, meaning they are using cryptocurrency to uh, create engagement, incentivize, monetize their employees. Don't think of Bitcoin. Don't think about FTX right now. We're not talking about that. It's the world of cryptocurrency and blockchain is way beyond everything that's happening in the, in the medias right now. So don't get bogged down by that. But organizations have an opportunity to to have cryptocurrencies inside of the organization. It doesn't mean that there's monetary outside of the organization. This is strictly something that's inside of my org. Um, so again, Henry can be onboarded. I can be given a certain amount of tokens as, hey, Henry, this is your, your funny money to, to play with while you're inside uh, of our organization. As the journey goes as an employee is progressing and growing within an in a organization, there's naturally a development plan or you hope there's a development plan, right? So what this, this means is a, a individual can start to unlock their training by using a certain amount of social tokens. You're gamifying the experience. And I, I think all of us naturally like a little bit of a game when it comes to our lives. We like challenges. We like to unlock things. We like to be prized and given things for our, our, our progress. So that's what's happening here. You can be given a certain amount of social tokens Earn, earn through project performance, participation in social and cultural activities, contribution to knowledge dissemination, management, and so on, right? So like as you're going through these challenges, you continue to, to gain these social tokens, which then for you can use to unlock your development plan, you continue to do your training, it's fun, it's more engaging, and you are uh, naturally kind of progressing up your development plan. The cool thing about this too, and I know some people are a little more private about their lives, but you can make this a challenge between your colleague who's next to you and you. They can see exactly where you are in your development journey. And this can be kind of a battle between both of you, right? I, I think organically as humans, we're a little more competitive. 
So again, that's a, you, Henry, that's yeah, that's exciting to think about. Sorry, I know you're you're getting on a roll. We are a little bit at time. Uh, right. Let's make sure okay. you get give give us just the absolute gold last comment or two that you have for everybody. Woo. That's a hard one. Um, I think that the, the gold aspect of this is that we, we have the opportunity uh, or to, to embrace technology that is happening. It's not going away, such as Web3, self-sovereign identity. This is a time for us to be able to embrace new technology because as we know, technology is not static, it's dynamic. We have the opportunity to own ourselves finally. And I think that is my biggest mission is that I, I personally revolted against social media five years ago because I hated the fact that my information was being mined and used against me. I now have the ability to control my information. And this component, this technology is now allowing us to do that through Web3. And it's going to impact the way we do business now and into the future, um, which will, again, gamify, increase engagement, and it will increase culture and community within the workplace uh, of tomorrow. Unbelievable. I, Henry, you have also defined uh, the next webinar for the Chicago chapter of Cornette. Uh, <laughs> that is worth awesome. digging into more, Heather. Uh, I'll turn it back to you, but um, uh, thank you everybody for for joining us today. Thank you, especially to our panelists, Henry, Nishar, Jet, uh, and Eddie. A, a phenomenal topic. Thank you to Cornette for supporting this topic. And uh, Heather, please take us home. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining today. And if you haven't already, be sure to register for our December 8th program. We're gonna be live back in person and it's gonna be artificial intelligence meets IndyCar meets commercial real estate. So you don't wanna miss out. All right, everyone have a great weekend. Thanks guys. All right. Thanks everyone. Thank Thanks you. all. Thank you.